Today is Saturday, June 13th, 2009. My name is Karen Neuror and I'm a librarian at Oklahoma State University Library in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I'm here in Los Angeles, California at the home of Kim and Susan Grossman. And I'm here to interview you today for an oral history project of the Oklahoma State University Library. The project is titled Remembering Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel, Poet and Oklahoma Dust Bowl Immigrant. Thank you, Susan and Kim, for allowing me to come into your home and interview you for this today. You're very welcome. Now, Susan, I understand that you are um, related to mm -hmm. Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Wilma's mother was my maternal grandmother's first cousin. Uh, they were both finsters. And that's pretty much it. That's, that's how I'm related. And we, our families weren't very close. And then when Wilma's father and family came out during the 30s, they uh, lived on my grandfather's ranch in Livingston, California for a while. But, and then they uh, moved in with my great-grandfather, Jeremiah Finster. And that was, I think that was close to Livingston. I don't remember exactly the town. And so they lived there. And then I think they, you know, the rest, I think they moved up to Northern California at one point. And our families lost touch with each other. And we found her again in the 90s through the, through Patty Russell Curry, who was doing genealogy research. And she told me, she said, you know, you've got this cousin that's a poet. And I said, yeah. And I had tried to find her because there was an article in the LA Times about her. And I talked with my mother about it. And we called up information. And Unfortunately, she didn't have a listing at the time, and then my mother died, and so, and she was kind of the last person that really knew all the stories. So, mm -hmm. that's. Do you have? I know that this was a long time ago when your uh, grandparents or great grandparents had the um, ranch land or farmland in California. Do you have any memories of your grandparents or, or great grandparents at all, and that what the land was like and, and what that was like? I don't have any memory of my great-grandparents. They all died before I was conscious. At, I think they might have been alive when I was little, but I don't remember ever meeting them. My grandparents, yeah, I remember my grandfather's ranch very well. And it was, uh, he grew walnuts and almonds and grapes. And he had this great old barn, of which actually we have some pictures. We went out there a few years ago, and it's still there, still being farmed. It's mostly almonds now. It's just off the 99 Highway, out just to, in the outskirts of Livingston, which is a little tiny little town in the Central Valley. And he had uh, this wonderful old barn, and he had these huge eucalyptus trees that he had planted around when he first bought the farm when he came back from Alaska and met my grandmother in like the 19... 1920s because my mother was born in 1925 and she was the oldest child of my grandmother's second marriage and my grandfather's first marriage and my grand I think my mother and her sisters were all born at the house there on the farm mm -hmm. okay tell me again your grandparents names were what my grandfather was Derwood Cooper he was known as Bob and my grandmother who was the Finster related to Wilma's mother was uh, Florence Finster Cooper. Okay. And they had how many children? My grandmother had six children and my grandfather had four. She had a previous marriage to another Finster cousin, which is another family secret that's oozing its way out, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> no one would talk about that either when we were young. <laughs> okay. So you first... Um really learned about Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel in the 1990s then. Mm -hmm. Can you describe your first meeting with her? What, how did that transpire? What was, was it with Bill? Yes. Yeah, we went up, my brother Bill, who lives in Montana, came for a visit and we went with him. We were visiting relatives in Central California and we, one of the stops we made was to visit with Wilma. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where we first met her. Was she in her apartment? Mm -hmm. then? She's always, always, always in her apartment. She opened the door for us. She invited us in. She, she indicated where we should sit. She sat down, and uh, 
basically said some intro about, well, how did this all come about or something? And then she talked with Susan. She, I remember she talked with you extensively. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, was, it was really a nice time. Yeah, it was, it was it real was nice. Really. fun to meet such a prodigious person under those circumstances. Very ordinary. Yeah, it's this tiny one-room apartment. More well, one more bedroom. More cluttered than our house, <laughs> but more purpose driven. She was, she had, she had amazing focus. Well, and she had wonderful stuff all around her books and drawings and her angels, on, angels on the wall. Angels on the walls. Yeah. A what kind of angels? Little paper angels she would so make she and cut out. Her stuff. Oh, her things that she made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. And she, that other people gave her. She had a lot of uh, personal items uh, on mm -hmm. the walls. That she either she made her people. So what did that give you a sense of being in her her place, her environment there? I definitely felt that she knew what she was about. She didn't make a big deal about it, but I felt that she was very clear about who she was and how she was. And she, she was very welcoming to Susan. She was very happy to have made the connection herself. I remember that. And she, you really felt like you were with you were with a real artist, and with an artistic sensibility and a richness. I always loved visiting her because if nothing else, I would find out about magazines I'd never heard of, books I'd never heard of. She was collected in a lot of books. I don't know where it is now, but there's this wonderful book about working women mm -hmm. that she was collecting. You know, and it just was that alone was great. I just keep making notes like, oh, I didn't know about this, and I didn't know about that. Out there in Tulare, I don't know, you know, it's hard to see, you know, here we live in Los Angeles, a big sophisticated city. I mean, Tulare is really just a, a wide spot in the road with a bunch of cattle farm, cattle dairies and totally. It was exciting to visit her, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it was always very interesting. She was always something new. Did she tell family stories when you were together since you were family? She would talk about my great-grandfather, Jeremiah Finster. Uncle Jerry, that's what, because he was her uncle. And she talked some about my grandmother who had an unhappy life, getting an unhappy marriage and then an un, and she was, she had an unhappy life that uh, just, you know, she just had a lot of difficulty in her life. And so they always felt, she always said, oh, we always felt sorry for Florence, poor Florence, poor cousin Florence. And what did she talk about her? family a little, not too much. She talked about her brother. She talked about Roy. She talked about Roy, what was going on, because Roy lived across the way from her, and so they were the last. By the time we had met her, everybody else had died, her her sisters, brothers, mother. So there was, it was just her and Roy, and mm -hmm. so she talked, of course, about him a lot, and I think that was, we didn't go too much. I mean, we did try to figure out why the families lost contact, but we never, it was never too clear we think it had something to do with flowers sent when my uncle was killed in a car accident and that they weren't acknowledged, mainly because my aunt, aunts didn't know who, they didn't understand who it was from, so they, it was just an oversight, but Wilma's mother took it to heart. And we talked, a, she always said very nice things about her father. She loved her, felt very close to her father. She really loved her father. Now, that is not the point of view my family had about her father, so. Oh, really? Yeah, so we didn't talk, we didn't really no. pursue that too much. Uh -huh. <laughs> she talked about her work. Yeah, she talked about her oh, work. Oh, she talked about dealings with publishers. Yes, a lot about publishers. And uh, trying to get things uh, straight. So, in a frustrating way, what, what did you... Well, I think she was she terribly frustrated because I really feel that she felt that she had control. But... I, I did get the feeling that she found some of the, the process she had to engage in annoying. I was very clear that she was uh, very focused on her poetry and delivering it. And that, that was what was really important to her. I think she was working on a collective poems. I don't think that ever really came together. And I remember her talking a lot about her being very frustrated about that process and how it kept her because her energy was so limited by that point because she was in her 80s how frustrating that was because it kept her away from writing mm. and it was really at that point for her either or work on the collected poems or write new poems you know that that's why she she was offered to be the poet laureate in the state of california you know tell me about that i've heard a little well, bit she turned it that. down she turned it down 
she she said, and I asked her why, and she okay. said, well, I want to write poetry. I don't want to go around talking about it. Mm-hmm. And she said there was a lot of, you know, There's formal a lot things of public you had to go functions do. You have to go to. She uh, wasn't interested in that at all. And she, she couldn't went, travel at that. It just was be too hard for her. Oh, she wanted to write poetry. Mm-hmm. She didn't want to talk to people about it. She would talk to us about it if you wanted to, mm-hmm. or you or anybody who wanted to talk to her about her poetry. She didn't want to go around uh, with any big fanfare and have to go lecture to people and all that kind of nonsense. For her, mm-hmm. that would have been nonsense. Mm-hmm. So uh, it made sense to me. I think you have to be pretty secure in knowing who you are, what you're about to turn down such a fabulous uh, uh, honor. Do you know anything about the process for the nominations for that, how that works or anything? No, it's just she ended up on top. One year she ended up I don't on know top. How and it works. Or what year, what time frame would that have been when that happened even? You know, it must have been the 90s because it seemed like it was a recent thing that they had asked when she mentioned okay. it. I can't, uh, gosh, because I, mean, I remember when, at the time because I followed who the poet was. I don't know when we first talked to her there. That happened within a year or so. Yeah, it was years. pretty close. Very sometime, close. Probably sometime in the 90s. He was, he was, I was governor then, Pete Wilson. Uh, I was curious. I mean, yeah. why would somebody turn out something so prestigious? Mm-hmm. And that, it was a nuisance for her. She wants to well, deliver you know, it poetry. Is. And you have to write poetry for public occasions, and you have to travel a lot, and they, don't, they only pay you like a dollar a year. It's not... I don't think they give you any money. And she was really and she was poor, very poor. Very mm-hmm. poor. You mentioned that um, there was an article in the LA Times about her, mm-hmm. and that that sort of led to the. Yeah, I've got a copy. I can send it to you again. By uh, Peter King. Try to get a right, get a hold of him. The same road led everyone to this place. It's about her. What date is her date on that? Uh, I think I have this one. Huh? Hmm. Oh, I clever. I cut it out, but I don't have the date. Okay. It was definitely the middle 90s, 1990s. So, and he wrote about her more than once. He's no longer, he hasn't been with the Times for a while. I tried to get, I think I got an email from him because I was asking him about it. And, and he, he's, he's moved on. Mm-hmm. So, did you already know that you were related when you saw that article? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Why did I know that? I think my mother said saw it or said something. Because she had mentioned, my mother had mentioned once in a while, she'd say, you know, we have a cousin who's a poet. She, she's a poet and she's called like the milk, what do they call her? The biscuits and... Biscuits and gravy. Yeah, poet. Mm-hmm. And I think we both saw this article. Mm-hmm. Or I saw it and I asked her about it and I said I tried to find... Her through information, I think that he had said, did he say Visalia? He might have said Visalia, and I looked in Visalia. And Visalia, well, it's next door to Tulare. I guess they don't have the same phone directory, so. Different zip code. I guess, yeah. So we just missed contact. But then uh, she did a reading, I think, and Patty found her. Describe um, Wilma's personality and mannerisms for me, if you would, please. She was, she wanted to talk about what was going, what her art, her life, what was it? Mainly she just sit down and talk about She was very herself. direct. There was no flapping around. When she sat in her chair, she was in her chair and she talked. She didn't really, it was a struggle by that time physically for her to get around and she would get around when she wanted to. But no, like her poetry, no wasted motion, which was, I thought, kind of curious. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because as you're following her conversation, her thoughts and ideas, it's very lively. And she'd speak in full sentences and paragraphs, you know, no umming, anding, that kind of thing. She'd just, just sit in her chair and talk. Yeah, she was totally unconfused. <laughs> Yeah, sharp to the end. Even yeah. when we visited her in the nursing home, remember the hospital on the way. Was what about a year somebody, before she died? I think. Yeah, she was uh, totally aware and alert. It was odd. She was annoyed by her 
uh, physical her, body, her yeah. physical impairments, but she didn't whine about it. It was just it was just like well it's kind of this way and she dealt with it. Mm -hmm. She didn't like it, but she dealt with it and. and None of this old person aches and pain stuff, even though she, you know, she was subject to it. She still had this vehicle for her, her poetry. Yeah. And, and that was very, clearly very satisfying for her. After your initial meeting, how frequently did you, were you able to see her or talk to her? You had some correspondence that... Yeah, I think her. we saw her at least once a year. Mm -hmm. And you would call and her. And I call her. I call her about once every month or two. Mm -hmm. And, talk and she to would her. call you. Yeah, once in a while she'd call. So we had, you know, some correspondence. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause, cause she would call us. This is Cousin Wilma. Mm -hmm. She would just simplify it that way. Yeah. So we talk. You know, the last few years were very tough because she, she had a uh, stroke and broken hip and just was in and out of the hospital and the nursing home. It was tough, very tough for her, mm -hmm. as it is for most people at that age. Did she ever talk about her family's migration to California? No, she didn't really. I learned more about it from Roy than I did from her. Did she ever say much about the actual moving out here? No, I remember her talking about coming to the farm, though. Yeah, and the, what my memory of is that it was... But I remember what my mother said was that it was raining and they came at night, knocked on the door, and there was there they were looking for a place to stay. Mm -hmm. But and, she, I don't remember ever any conversation about the actual migration. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I didn't, and and what it was like when they got here. I mean, it must have been terribly traumatic because everyone was so desperately poor. It's, you know, you show up on your relative's doorstep and they didn't have any money. You know, they were barely making it and. The, the prejudice against the migrants, it was, and so I think it was very humiliating for people. They just didn't want to talk about it. But then they stayed on my grandfather's ranch for a while. Mm -hmm. He gave them a place to stay. And so, Do you know how other family members felt about them showing up and like that and helping? I don't know. No, help? but they wouldn't. They didn't talk about it. I guess my great great grandfather he took them in and helped them out because she talked a lot about how generous he was. And uh, yeah, I don't think they didn't talk about that were, much at all. Roy doesn't either. I think it was just a very hard time. It was a hard time. There were no interpersonal conflicts or anything like that. She didn't talk about anything like that at all. No. No, they did. It's it was. I think her father. I think was. A very charming man and he told I guess he told wonderful stories and but he also had a, a, a drinking problem and there were there was some so that was that was a problem and he was the he was the cause of the death of his son because it, it happened and the murder happened on my grandfather's branch. So he was de the son was defending him wasn't yeah the, well the son was trying to break up the fight the father had tried to take some food from some transient people that were staying there too and they got into a fight and the son tried to intervene and then he was shot by the transient and killed who then went to jail but uh, and I think and I think that that caused some friction in the family because everyone felt that the son who got killed was a wonderful person very stable hard-working and I think they kind of blamed the father and I think that Wilma's family was protective of the father and I think that was, I think that was a source of a lot of estrangement, but you won't get anyone to tell you that. <laughs> well, you just did. <laughs> well, but that's my surmise. That's surmising okay. from a bunch of stuff I picked up. It's on record. Up. Yeah, I picked it's up. It's on record. I'm looking right at it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, the facts of the of what happened, that's, that's, in that's, the pub, that's public. You, well, yeah. no, the guy was, you know, he was tried and yeah. there went is, to prison. There's probably a newspaper account. There must it. be, you know, you there must think. be something. You know. Because so, that didn't know. happen, you know, this kind of murder, you know. Things yeah. didn't happen very often in those little towns. And that's something, you know, no one wanted to... Those kind of events in those small towns were... Shame was so, you know, don't you don't want to be well, ashamed. That, that, you don't want to be associated with bad behavior. There was a lot of shame in all that. Oh, it's interesting. Oh, all, all, you know, my grandmother's second marriage. And, you know, there was just so much oh, yeah, hiding. Yeah, was different and, back then. Yeah, people knew every single detail about everyone's life. And they judged you and you were stuck in a certain position in those little towns. You could never get out of them. It was... Uh, 
was very precarious. One's social position really related to one's success in life. And so it was a, it's a very hard time for everybody. Did Wilma ever talk about her Oklahoma roots at all? I don't remember Very, all. very little. I once sent her a tape of This American Life story with Sarah Val talking about the Trail of Tears, Oklahoma, because she was Cherokee, mm -hmm. she's part Cherokee as well, and talking about it, and I sent her a tape, and and Wilma was glad to get it, but she didn't want to, she did I just, she didn't want to talk about it. Because mm. I poked, I tried, I mm -hmm. asked questions. Someone, um, someone recently that I interviewed actually um, made a, a bit of a, a parallel to the Trail of Tears, although that was a, a forced migration and the Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl was a forced migration too, if you really think about it. Circumstances really drove people. I because think they were tenant farmers, and they were, or they lost their land, and they were pushed off the land. It just took like the very, Cherokee. it took very little to have Wilma be comfortable, which leads me to imagine that the that whole background must have been so hard, so tough that you know, if you've got a little, you've got a little bowl of porridge here. You're doing great, you mm -hmm. know. So, uh, no, she didn't really talk about that. She didn't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think that you find what you need to know about that from her in her work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Even Roy is, he was older. I think he came out separately. You know, he doesn't know all the details. And he was he became independent sooner. So his his perspective on that is a little different. It doesn't, he doesn't have all the details. Well, and that also says something to her um, her her remembering her memory and her eye for obs her observational mm. you know eye and ear which certainly comes out in her work too uh, incredibly so oh think, yeah 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 so what do you think about her writing brutal <laughs> I said really? it before <laughs> I just I, I I've read some of her poems and just felt like somebody hit me upside the head with a two by four. She there's just no every ounce of fat is trimmed off of it and it's a very direct statement of whatever it is she's talking about. Dimes worth of time. I don't even have a dime's worth of time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think of it as transparent. You don't. There's nothing between you and the experience and what she's trying to relate. She doesn't get involved in fancy language. She's not trying to hide it. It's just very real. And I like I like it very much. I like the simplicity. The simplicity, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it's very successful. Bare bones. That's it's just a bare bones poet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any sense of how other people um, view her work? I mean, you're down here in L.A. and I don't know. Do we know anybody that knows about her? She did have a you know a coterie of people around right. her that uh, recognized what a gem she was, uh, and there 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 was some fawning over her. She did not care for that. Oh, she did not. Oh, oh, that was not the way. If you wanted to ingratiate your yourself with woman McDaniel, what you did is helped her out. You did something that she needed done. You got some photographs printed for her. Mm. Or took some photographs. Or took some photographs. It was just mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Um, I do remember when you gave her that uh, tape recorder, though. She she had a a need for a cassette tape recorder, and my, and my wife uh, uh, went out and got her one. She was extremely grateful. You know, I think this will really help me. Thank you so much. And, and that's pretty much it. But. Uh, no need for people who were uh, ingratiating themselves. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, in terms of how people, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's I would run across periodically people because I've I've been interested in poetry for many years, and so then kind of run across people at poetry readings who would know who she was, which always surprised me because it just seemed like a. Because my relationship with her really had to do with family, not so much literary, and yet there were people that knew of her in a literary way. And it was just, it was funny how they could have these different... 
Threads. What was that bookshop we went to? It was either Merced or Fresno, I don't know. And they had all these... these Modesto. Uh, Modesto, was it? Mm -hmm. And they had all these these books of hers that you couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah, well, and uh, uh, the odd thing, was, well, this is a wonderful story. The first time we met her, she had this magazine on her table called Full Moon. I have a copy of it. Well, Kim knew the people that were publishing it. They worked at the place he worked. And he had a picture in it that they had published. And there was her poem in the I, same magazine. Before I even before knew Before we her. knew who she was or what. Because I, I saw it and I said, hey, you know, Kim, there's your magazine. And there was her poem in it. And that just tickled her to death. She thought that I was think this it. was it, wasn't it? The one. No, it's the not one? in that. It was. It's not in either of these oh, two. Oh, okay. You got it somewhere. It's a, it's okay. So we had crossed paths. She and I had crossed inadvertently crossed paths before. Mm -hmm. But as her spouse, uh, I here. Uh, let me do this. <laughs> you, you, you don't want me too far out of the camera. Right? So that's, that's right. She's a star. She's, yeah. she's a star. But that was that. Just seemed like it seemed like all this confluence of of. Uh, Fate. Event of fate, yeah, that we would uh -huh. meet like that and see that on her little table there in Tulare. Now, Kim, there's this uh, there's this great photograph of Will. I would like to hear the story about that. Well, she these photos. I was learning how to see better by doing some photography, and uh, it, was, it was fun to take portraits. So I just asked her if I could take some portraits, and I had this. Uh, uh, really fabulous tool for it and uh, managed to shoot off several rolls of uh, 120 film and got got the sheets made and I indicated uh, some of what I thought were the, the better photographs and she went through them and looked at them and, and she picked out two, one in particular and asked me if I might have uh, a number of them made up for, which I was happy to do, uh, really nice uh, uh, silver gelatin prints, you know, so she could give them to museums. My personal ambition was to be able to have her photograph uh, uh, that I took in any number of museums that she wanted to have her work done in, mm -hmm. including, she said, stuff two places in Oklahoma, maybe your place was one of them. It wouldn't have been us yet at that point, probably. Yeah. Well, I thought this was cool. She was very great. kind to let me do that. With Bill, her her uh, uh, elder of the two brothers, uh, she also gave him some, some. she sprinkled some of her fairy dust on him, too. And, well, she was uh, very helpful. If you were an artist, she worked helped you out. Oh, get, yeah. Helped you get published. She'd say, try this publication. Uh, she'd tell people about you. She was very, very generous, and it's not every artist that will do that. <laughs> she returned she the favor. She helped Bill, she helped you, you know, she just gets your stuff out there and she really mm -hmm. helped. So she, it sounds like she was very knowledgeable about the process oh, of yes. how to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. 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 She, she knew a lot of publishers, she a lot had of places that, to put your stuff. Yeah, she had that stuff locked down. She knew what she needed to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, all in the service of her craft. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna run a little short on time here. Um, do you have do any favorite poems or prose come to mind when you think about her work in particular? Well, I that poem on her gravestone that right. was on her gravestone, and I really love this. Uh, where is this is the one you were thinking of, wasn't it? Was it? No, no, it was that. I mean, this isn't a, a poem, but it's a little. Novella, I guess we live and die in Pixley. Mm -hmm. I just, to me, it's just so. It just exudes that sense of the little small towns in the Central Valley that didn't change much until maybe the seventies or eighties. I mean, they were just the same way they were in the fifties and sixties when we visit my relatives as they were when my mother was growing up there, and it just captures it. And it's so spare, and it's just like the air used to be in the Central Valley, clear and dry. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's oh, not because uh, of all another the word is, appropriate but... for her work, terse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just all her wonderful poems. I don't have one in particular, but... What, what should people know about Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel? Oh, she was the real deal. Honest to God, she really was a person 
dedicated to her craft, mm -hmm. somebody who did it for the, for want of a better word, the pleasure of producing uh, the product that she did. As I said earlier, she knew what she was about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was, she was a true poet, a true artist. She wasn't playing at it. She wasn't... Yeah. No affectations. She was, yeah, she was the... I don't know. You know, she was the real, the real thing. I, that's. I just wish I had a better way of saying, describing the the trueness of her. She was. It wasn't a joke. She wasn't a primitive. You know, it. She was the real thing. She really, like you said, she worked on her craft. But she knew. She knew what she was doing, and uh, she was also very spiritual. Uh, her religion was extremely important to her. I think she. I think her family were Protestants, probably Baptists, and then she converted to Catholicism at some point as an adult, and she became a lay Franciscan, and it was all that was very important, important to her. And I think the uh, she had a very strong pro-life position. I don't think she. I think I mentioned something once about being pro-choice, and she was not happy with me about that. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, she didn't talk about politics, but I think that that was very, very close to her. And she was also loved country music. She was a big fan of Merle Haggard's and Buck Owens, and, and she would go to events, and I think that, I think they would bring her up on the stage. She was very well known in that part of the Southern Central Valley, where they call it the Bakersfield Sound, country music comes from. And Buck Owen. Yeah, and she was very, very much involved in, in all those kinds of arts down there. And she was also, her family was very important. And family. She was very happy when we all made, remade contact with her. And what was refreshing for someone like me, a city person, was that she was so profoundly without affect. No affectation. Kind of, kind of refreshing, huh? Really. Mm-hmm. What would you like to see? Um, I know that she didn't seek awards or honor during her lifetime. Certainly she wanted her work out there and she freely gave and sent it and she wanted it published. But what, what would you like to see happen with her and her legacy now? Oh, I think she should be recognized as a, as a, as a great American poet. Mm -hmm. She is one of these type of people, and uh, mm -hmm. you're the one that's well read. I mean, there, there, <laughs> there are other there are other poets, uh, uh, American poets, that are recognized and everything. And I see no reason, looking at what work of hers I had and seeing what other people have done, that she shouldn't be among them. She's a um, she's a star uh, in the firmament, and that's where she should be. Yeah, and I'm so glad you're doing this because okay. it is, it's. An important, she's an important voice for a lot of reasons. Because of her own voice, her own skill, her own oh. poetry, but also because she reflects an experience that really hasn't been out, disseminated very much. And it's a, it's a very important part of the American experience that is not, people don't know, because people weren't, they weren't well educated, they didn't have access to this kind of expression and to be able to develop it. And so I think it's, just terrific. You know, as a person who's studied in academia, I'm sure you, you have, right? <laughs> a little bit, right? Well, it, isn't it wonderful to read the works of somebody that after you've read them, it doesn't need to be explained to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no explanation needed. Her work is accessible by yeah. many ages and anyone, really. And that's that's one of the beautiful things I've seen uh, some high school students came to one of the programs in Oklahoma and they came for extra credit, you know, that their teacher was giving, of course. Um, but they really liked it. They could get mm -hmm. it, you know. And I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's great to see uh, the young people connect with it, you yeah. know, too, in that way. Are there any... Uh, Kim said that you're the literary person here. Oh, are, there, yes, <laughs> are there any are there any writers that you um, would uh, say that well, she's similar 
to this person in American literature? Oh, I... American literature. I think she's like a number of contemporary writers who are uh, not, they are not from the class that would have been educated until fairly recently, they're, and they're expressing their voice. I think of uh, Philip Levine, who, while he's an urban poet in that, he grew up, I think, in Detroit, but his poems about working in a factory and the poems about work and, and that strain in American poetry that's been getting out there more, I think of her in that way, although I don't think, I think she had a tiff with him in particular. I used to ask her about him, and she, like, oh. she didn't seem to like him or Gary Soto very much. I don't know if you know Gary Soto. He's a Hispanic poet from from California. So I think that that kind of uh, poetry from an experience that isn't usually captured. And I just, to me, I mean, I've read I've read a lot of poetry, and she's a real poet. She's not. It isn't like oh, she's. A historically interesting writer and oh she wrote poetry but you know it's not real po it can't stand on its own i think it can stand on its own without oh. knowing the backstory without being placed the historical part i think it can stand on its own and so that yeah when she talked about her work in comparison with others she talked as if it's of course she's among these yeah it was no big deal but it wasn't it wasn't a point of she wasn't bragging it wasn't something where she was full of herself or anything. Of course, she can talk about these other people and everything because she's one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, I'm glad it's accessible. It should not be overlooked. When people look at poets in the United States of the 20th century, she should be in that mix. Mm -hmm. you know, it shouldn't be a big deal. So, and and I'm sure it will because uh, her work is so. Um, um, simply impactful you really can't get away you can't read can't read one of her poems and walk away from it like well i got that done check it off on the list mm -hmm. it's going to bother you for a bit <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. dime's yeah. worth the time <laughs> yeah the poems about raisins and grapes i was just thinking about that but yeah just what it's like yeah. out there working in the fields Okay, we're about out of time here. So if you have any last thing that you want to share, now's the time. Really, something really salient to, to the <laughs> point. I think I said everything I needed to say about Wilma. Yeah, well, I think, you know, all I can say is she's not just, I mean, you're from Oklahoma, and she's an important part of that history, but she's an important part of California history. Right. In California, there's a California that was here before all these people moved from the East Coast to make movies, and, uh, you know, there's a... a a California culture, and she's a very important part of that. And I'm just glad that it's you know she's not being forgotten, not yet. And she has that thread that will be there. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm glad I got to meet her. Yeah, we were you really, know to that be was around the great, the, great the, experience to be around the real deal to get get the vibe from it, if you will. Pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish yeah, I regret. It's great to be around a real artist. I regret I had to work one of those horrible IT jobs, you know. So, we, and she too, that we didn't have the time to be able to go up and, yeah, and visit, visit as much a little as bit wanted. more. We would have mm -hmm. liked to spend a little bit more time with her mm -hmm. just uh, to listen to the way she talked. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Karen. Appreciate your participation and uh, it's been a great interview. It's been wonderful hearing your memories. Well, I hope this helps the university, and I hope this helps get her work, sustain her work being out there, because people who like poetry, uh, in my experience in the United States, they've heard about her. Mm. Yeah, they've heard yeah about she's her. gotten her. Yeah. So, yeah, we're working on that. Well, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful. Okay, thank you.